I'm delighted to welcome to the show today a lovely lady who I met recently, Sugra Kalik. Welcome to the show, Sugra. Thank you very much, Elaine. Thanks for inviting me. And I have to say, although the listeners won't uh, see this, you've got absolutely beautiful skin, and that's part and parcel of what you do as a holistic therapist and trainer, isn't it, with, within spas? That's what I do, and the skin's become a bit of an obsession, really. So luckily, it kind of works really well with my work as well. It's been a, it's been a long term a long term project with having suffered with a lot of skin issues myself. So so um, most people that I interview on the program have all come to what they're doing today as a result of something going wrong in their life, and then them learning and training and so on and so forth. So so um, tell tell us about your story then, Sugra. I didn't really get into the holistic spa field until after about the age of 25. I knew there was always something there about it that I wanted to do. So the age of 25 for me was, it was a fair while ago. So it was something that in the background was just always talking to me. If I saw anything relating to aromatherapy, holistic healing, skin related things. And I worked at a university in Derby at the time and I just felt, I know that I want to go down this route, but I never actually really thought of it as a career. You know, when something's a passion, you don't always think of it as a career or think how it's going to turn into a career. So a great starting point for me was, you know what, let me just go and learn some of these therapies because I'm interested in the healing aspect, but I'm interested in the business aspect because I think this is also going to become a big business. And that's where it really started with me spending four years part time becoming a beauty therapist, holistic therapist. And actually I suffered with really bad acne in my twenties, thirties and forties. And I'm probably one of those people. I've tried everything over the counter, everything from the doctors. Um, every, I couldn't say online because at that time there wasn't the online and just tried everything from medication to holistic therapies, um, traditional, non-traditional, everything. And it really, it just got me into the spa business world. Um, so I feel like this has been my lifelong career, even though it was my second career, really. What was your first career? So I worked in administration and worked at a university for 10 years, which I absolutely loved. And you know, when you look back at something and you think, I think well, that was the making of me and I never really appreciated it at the time. So when you're 18 and you get thrown in head first, to deal with something because somebody thinks that you're probably capable and you can do it, but you're not, you're just learning on the job. So dealing with parents, students, academics. So dealing with the whole array of people and the way that they work and the way that they think you learn a lot in that time and you get a lot of responsibility put on you and being an admin, actually it makes you organized and makes you see things in a certain way. So when I've worked in business later, I've sometimes I've been baffled at, skills that people need to pick up because I think I took for granted what I learned in that time but it gave me such a solid base. I, I have this thing that nothing is ever wasted it doesn't matter what you do how you do it who you do it with nothing is ever wasted um, I, I think you know I, I now live in Portugal most of the time and uh, I'm now using uh, information that I first came across nearly 40 years ago and, it's, and I find it quite amusing, the fact that uh, I can now use this transferable knowledge that I've learned all that time ago, never dreaming that I'd be using it today. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. And you said 20s, 30s and 40s. Um, yeah. I have to ask how old you are. You, don't, you, you, you barely look 25. Well, exactly two weeks ago, I turned 48. Wow. Well, wow. congratulations <laughs> on your birthday. So you're a fellow Thank Aquarian you. then. Yeah, I'm an Aquarian. And I think, you know, like I do always say to ladies that I'm not someone who says there's anything wrong with lines or wrinkles or you need to get rid of them. It's not that. When I ask most people what they want, they want to look fresh and radiant and not tired and just have the best skin they can have because we're all born into a skin that's susceptible to different things. So your skin is always a work in progress and susceptible to different things at different phases in your life. So I really help women to understand that and manage it the best they can. Brilliant. And people don't realise that the, the skin is our biggest organ, isn't it? Yeah. And it's, it's subjected to everything. So it, it covers everything. It holds everything in. It's the first thing to face everything. Um, 
it collects a lifetime of, you know, you, you can call it debris if you like, or memories or both. So sometimes we don't treat it very well. And it shows all of our scars. It shows everything that you've been through. So it's having an appreciation for it. And I don't even really like to say imperfections. I don't like to use the word anti-aging because they're just character. It's just everything about yourself. There was um, probably, I don't know if you remember him, with it, that Sid James in the Carry On films. Yeah. Uh, he had a face that I, I call a lived-in face. And some people Definitely. do have those kind of craggy, craggy lived-in faces that, that it does, does say everything, doesn't it, about them? And uh, wonderful yeah. faces. Yeah. So, so what kind of therapies do you do? I'm qualified in quite a lot, but my real passion and the things that I still work as a therapist in those fields is facial so advanced skin care reflexology and a few advanced forms of massage so one particular being indonesian massage because it's it's powerful it has a great effect for the customer but on the side when i teach it as well it's a great therapy that therapists can deliver without exhausting themselves so you're delivering a great result but you're also looking after yourself at the same time so you teach therapists on a whole wide range of um, activities? Yeah, so before I probably did it predominantly abroad. So this was mainly in Southeast Asia and the Middle East, but now I'm based mainly in the UK. So it's teaching people who are existing therapists, either face therapists or body therapists, to improve skills that they have and to develop and to empower them or to teach them something brand new that they've not learned before to either make them a rounded therapist or give them appreciation for a new skill, which sometimes makes sense for the business. Sometimes it doesn't. It just depends. A lot of people think that having a massage is, is a waste of time and it's indulgent. Well, well, how would you respond to that? I think it might have been once upon a time when we lived a different kind of life, but life has changed. And the challenge I give most people is I'll say, OK, if you feel that a massage is a waste of time and it's indulgent the first thing i'd like you to try is every day at some point for five minutes go and sit in a room by yourself where you won't be disturbed and switch your phone off and don't talk to anyone and just close your eyes and if you can do that let's see what happens as a result of that and most people find that quite a challenge and they realize that they never do it so because of the lifestyles that we've chosen to live and all the external factors that affect us it's become a must because we all need that me time quiet time recharge your batteries your mind actually needs quiet time to work and solve problems and to give you solutions and to give you new ideas so because that space is so limited in our lives now it, it's almost become essential it's, i wish that i could give people a prescription of right this is for your monthly massage you need this i would say to my customers once you book be very Afraid. it'll be very difficult to cancel because I need a good reason for your benefit not for mine and, and that's about putting yourself first isn't it you, you put your oxygen mask on first like they do on the airlines and I think women in particular have always been anti um, looking after themselves first because there's a husband the children you know elderly parents whatever we never put ourselves first do we we don't. And I think we're, it's because we're really wired differently to men. So I remember watching a segment on the Oprah show years ago and it just summed everything up. So it said, if you had a husband and a wife and you come home from work, the wife will very rarely say to the husband, oh, I need my feet massaging. And if he does massage her feet, she's going to be thinking, oh, he's so lovely. Oh, I'm so lucky. Oh, he's such a nice guy. You know what? Let me do his feet. If the husband asks the wife, the husband will have his feet massaged and thinking, this is amazing. Gosh, I so deserve this. Uh, I've really earned it. So the thinking is very different. So because we're programmed to give first, then we have that guilt attached to receiving. And actually, you're not equipped to give when you haven't looked after yourself first. So that's, that's the wiring, in effect, that we need to change. So do, do people get instant benefit when they've had a massage? I mean, what, what, what are the general benefits of having a massage? As somebody who, I, I can't bear anybody near me, I've got spine problems, and if anybody comes near me, I'd punch them rather than thank them. <laughs> I'll, I'll remember that, Elaine. So I think for somebody <laughs> like you, this is why we also have reflexology, because reflexology, in effect, is a full body treatment, but we're just exposing and working on the feet. 
what you the benefits are for the full body so the immediate benefits will be of course relaxation and that you've had the time out and in that moment and for the foreseeable i guess evening and the rest of the day you'll probably have a better sleep if you weren't feeling too well or you had a headache it can get rid of that makes you i always make people talk about an immediate issues in their life and i'll say right just set the intention that you're going to work that out in this moment of silence that you've given yourself so those immediate benefits definitely happen and um, I'll often get reports of, you know, I had a great sleep and I haven't slept properly for two weeks or I felt really energized the next day. Well, actually, I just wanted to go home and do a bit of work and I felt great and I was productive. So reflexology, how does how does that work? Talk us through the, the, the concepts. I've had reflexology and again, um, I've had double bunion surgery and I've got metal pins in my feet and I'm not. Right. So but I've had um, a, a hot stone. Uh, reflexology session a couple of those and they were absolutely lovely but um, mm -hmm. the person was very 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 careful with me okay so I mean firstly I'd say it dates back more than 3,000 years so there's evidence of the ancient Egyptians working on each other's feet for healing purposes so, and maybe it dates back further than that but that's how far back we can trace it they date further back but that's the evidence that we have and it's based on the principle and the belief that your feet are like a little map of your body and all your major organs and body systems can be mapped on the feet. And so it works on similar principles to, let's say, acupuncture, shiatsu, that there are energy meridians that run through the body. So right from the tips of your fingers to the tips of your toes. And what reflexology does by applying pressure to certain points in a set sequence is it promotes homeostasis, so it promotes balance by clearing the energy channels, by stimulating the circulation, and it may also help to pick up imbalances that are happening in certain parts of the feet. So it's amazing for people who, let's say, they don't want to have a body massage or they can't have one, but actually it's much, it's much more powerful than just a body massage, and people use it for all sorts of ailments, such as um, IBS, migraines um problems with the monthly cycle it can be used to treat women who are um having fertility issues or going through ivf so you know it's huge in that arena as well and so for me it's, it's probably my favorite treatment to offer and to teach how can it help people with ibs and infertility so if you if you look at the feet anatomically actually your foot is pretty much a direct reflection of your physical makeup so if you look at the proportions in the body the way the body is the shape of the spine that that's all reflected in your own feet so let's say you're working on the digestive area when you've created your map of the feet working on that area will help with irritable bowel syndrome because you're working in that energy area you're clearing the energy channels in that area and you're clearing blockages and because your feet have something like 3000 nerve endings is this is what makes it much more powerful than actually a body massage so for the recipient they'll they'll experience a lot more i guess after effects as well so you know without giving too much information i will say wow that really made me go to the loo much more than normal or i felt that i had a real detox and i feel much better so if people have it regularly this is when they'll really experience the longer term benefit interesting you use the word detox so i hadn't realized that um it had detoxing effects but when you think about it that the process you go through it would make sense so yeah yeah definitely um, how how do you how do you deal with people with cancer for example because that's my sort of specialist area supporting people through uh, recovery from cancer so how how would you deal with somebody from uh, a cancer perspective or, or in fact are you able to to um to support people with cancer i think it depends on you and what happens is a lot of there's a lot of scaremongering so there'll be a lot of right you know my insurance doesn't really cover me to work on you and i feel often that if someone is undergoing chemotherapy they're suffering from cancer or any other illness actually that's probably the time that you really need that treatment and for someone to actually care for you in that way so the things to be aware of is what reflexology can do so if you're on any medication it can make that medication work faster in a way in your system that's not to say it's going to make the healing process faster 
it might speed up the effect of it. So sometimes we're careful if someone's at the early stages of chemo because you're boosting the circulation so much that it might make them feel more ill initially. So, you know, let's say if you had a headache and somebody massages your head and actually it could make you feel really nauseous. In a, in a similar way, it could do that. But if somebody is performing okay on the therapy, you can adapt the reflexology so you can make it less stimulating, you can make it lighter. So you're doing it much more for relaxation purposes. And then as they come to the end of their chemotherapy, then you could start to work into your normal reflexology routine. Okay, and how about massage with, um, with cancer? I would say that I'm much more likely to give somebody a massage rather than reflexology if they have cancer because the way to look at it is I'll say to clients and to students especially, look, if your client has cancer and she's at home and she's had a shower and, you know, she spends 20 minutes applying body lotion or she asks her partner to give her a little bit of a massage because she needs relaxation, it's actually no different to giving somebody a body massage. There, would, there might be certain movements that I would leave out. So I probably wouldn't work around the lymph nodes too much. I wouldn't make it too stimulating. I would make it just much more lighter and for relaxation because the, I think the thing the person needs is that healing intention from your hands. So you've decided for their greater good, you're giving them this treatment to help them. And that's what it does. So there's, there's a lot of adaptations that you can make. Which is really encouraging because there's so few oncology masses um, that I've met and um, I know there are some specialist uh, trainers that, that, that uh, train people with cancer because obviously as you say certain movements are you know complete no-nos but it's nice that you've got that uh, all-encompassing approach but again that goes with your experience doesn't it? And you, you, I think so and I yes. think it can just be a confidence thing so Often when I've worked in spas, therapists will come and say, oh gosh, this person's diabetic or they're this or they've got high blood pressure. And it, it's just a confidence thing, really. So firstly, it's knowing how to be very realistic and talk to the person, make them feel comfortable and that actually everything that you're doing is for them, is for their benefit. And if you're not going to do it, it's going to be because it might be detrimental to them in some way. So it's establishing that rapport. And then from the years of experience, obviously, you understand that um, it it's not going to do any harm. Actually, you can just adapt it and they, they really, really need it at that point in their life. So um, what, what would be your top tips for people to relax? I'm saying people, it sounds as though predominantly you, you work with women. Is that right or have I misunderstood? Yeah, I that? do. I do. So what um, would be your, your top tips for relaxation? Do you mean in terms of therapies generally or lifestyle? Um, lifestyle. So I think it really starts from the moment that you wake up because I think what happens is you you can launch yourself into your day and I think establishing a daily routine is very important. So one of the things that I, I mean, I follow a lot of work of other people, you know, none of these things are things that I've invented. I just read a lot and study a lot. So I don't know if you've heard of SAVERS, which is an acronym for, I guess, a routine of what you can follow throughout the day. Um, and it really starts with having a moment of silence in the morning. So I think if you if you jump out of and you launch yourself into your day without any thought or concept of, OK, what did I want to achieve from this day? What am I going to put into this day? Then the day will just follow suit. It will just be crazy. You'll be run ragged. You'll have been dictated to rather than having any level of control. So I feel setting intentions for your day. Um, having moments of silence throughout the day, especially when you have a moment of panic or high stress, whether it's work or family related, is to never underestimate that at any point in the day, you can go and sit by yourself and you can have five minutes and it could be in the car. It could be hiding in the bathroom, it can be anywhere. And to give yourself that, because I think where I get that from is my dad, who sadly passed away last year, always said that if you work your day around your prayer and meditation rather than the other way around you'll be doubly productive in the hours that you spend on work so actually spending more hours of 
take and if you put those things in place first you'll be doubly productive in your day so what i try to motivate and inspire people to do is look have a planner write your three key things that you need to achieve for your family that day and three things that you need to achieve for work that day because we can always put more hours into work we can always put more time in but if you if you have a level of organization or a system there should be a point in the day where you think i feel really satisfied and i'm putting that area of my life to bed and now i'm going to focus on the family or i'm going to exercise so i think it's being realistic having a plan and then if you just start again the next day um i think just recently i started a concept or a, i guess a an initiative which is you know it's not a money making initiative it was just an wellness and it's about the psychology behind if you want to make positive change in your life just do it in really small increments and i started this with a group of people in december where it was one new thing that you add into your life every 21 days so it's a habit around wellness and once you've done the 21 days you add in a new habit but you keep the first one as well so it's not about removing anything it's not about substituting anything it's adding new habits that are to do with wellness so in a year you will have implemented 17 new habits into your life and that's how change happens just with small incremental changes so i don't believe in new year's resolutions and all that kind of thing i just think you have to go easy on and we spend we spend so long getting ourselves into a situation where we're not happy not happy with maybe how we look how we feel that we should be willing to give ourselves a year to turn that around slowly and sometimes people are not willing to give themselves that time so that's what i'm trying to encourage people to do that sounds really sensible 17 new things in a year it sounds undoable you know impossible but then when you break it down <coughs> excuse me a new habit every 21 days that's that sounds doable doesn't yeah. it so bite-sized yeah chunks. definitely yeah yeah you were talking about yeah. saver the acronym saver silence and setting intentions what were the other bits of saver oh the first one is silence so it's making sure you have a moment of silence when you wake up the second one is that you say to yourself and one of the ones i always try to get people to adopt i mean it's just a louise hay one really to say all is well in my world because i've seen the majority of the time at any point in the day all is well we just dramatize it because we're listening to the voice in the head the third one is visualization and i i appreciate visualization doesn't always work for everybody but it can happen through regular moments of silence and meditation so it's visualizing it could be an outcome for the day it could be something that you're working towards um it could be something in your business it could be something in your life the e is exercise so really movement whatever type of movement suits you even if it's a five minute walk around the block it can be that then the r is reading so and that's all to do with personal development or it could be timeouts it could be a novel or it could be personal development related and then the final one the s stands for scribing which is really writing so thinking about journaling and writing down it could be gratitude it could be what you've learned in the day what you did that you're really proud of um, and in reality it's not something that can take a long time so i would say all of those things together you know you it could be an hour but it can be an hour broken up throughout the day very sensible advice thank you so um we're going to have to stop now because this uh, stop start with electric power cuts the weather today is horrendous we've had three power cuts already today here so oh, yeah. uh, struggling a bit with it with this recording um but thank you very much for your tips there sugra um i asked oh, guests to choose a couple of songs and you've chosen two by sia unstoppable yeah. and never give up why did you choose these i think i've become aware <coughs> of sia for the last few years and when I listen to the songs, they they always have a strong message, and I was related to women because I'm a woman, and that's who I relate to, and that's my tribe of people. And but the way that she sings and the emotion that she conveys, it's almost very much like unstoppable, um, never give up. Because in life, you are always going to face hardship. 
and that that's a given but it depends how you look at it and it depends how you work on building yourself up and building resilience so it, it's really just to say that you can achieve anything in the face of anything and i'm a, i've always been a believer of that and it just more and more strongly as i get older really i endorse that wholeheartedly how do people get hold of you sugra they can get hold of me on linkedin just under my own name they can get hold of me on social media so my facebook profile and also on instagram i think you you need to spell your name i think for for the benefit of the listeners okay so my first name sugra is s for sugar u g h r a and my surname is Kalik, K-H-A-L-I-Q. And there are not too many of us on Facebook or LinkedIn. So hopefully I should come up. Okay, brilliant. Sugra Kalik, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks so much, Elaine. All the best.